Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Powerhouse Podcast, where we bring you the powerhouses in the mitochondria world. I'm your host, Brian Harmon, President and CEO of the UMDF, and we are so delighted to have this very special powerhouse, Phil, my my wonderful co-host, <laughs> Science Alliance Officer at UMDF, Dr. Phil Yasky. Glad to have you here, Phil. It's number 10. This is the 10th episode of The Powerhouse. It's like a big anniversary for us. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> now, considering we only do these once a month, right? Right. It takes a little bit of time to get to 10, but it's going to be a really special number 10 for us today. I'm excited yeah, for sure. to bring in our guest today. Before that, though, speaking of exciting, there's so much great work happening mm -hmm. at UMDF right now. I wanted to spend some time, you and I, just talking about some of these things. I mean, it's First and foremost, it's major planning season for us. I've been thinking sure. about, boy, we just, it felt like just yesterday, we wrapped up our virtual symposium and here we go. We're planning to be back live in June in Phoenix. Yeah, deep, deep into symposium planning, the, the, the scientific program, the family program, you know, thinking about the content we want that crosses over between the patient families and the research community. Um, I'm really pleased with the way it's coming together. And as you know, we've got two great uh, esteemed co-chairs and yes. Dr. Bob Navio and Richard Haas uh, working with us on it. So um, yeah, really looking forward to seeing everybody in person in Phoenix, June 3rd to 8th. Uh, no, you better check the dates. Check umdf.org. Yeah, it. check umdf.org. Right? <laughs> well, listen, <laughs> you you got every excuse in the book because I know you're really busy. And, and part of that is kicking off our, our annual grant cycle, our research program. I know we're starting to put that together for that yeah. to go live here um, in late winter. Yeah, we actually have a grant cycle open now. So this is a collaboration with our uh, patient advocacy group partners from around the world, the Lee Syndrome International Consortium. Uh, we have an open grant cycle right now for Lee syndrome focused uh, grants. Um, applications are coming in. We'll get those reviewed before the end of the year. And uh, our collective uh, pool for, for that grant cycle is 150,000 uh, US dollars. Uh, then in January, we'll kick off our annual UMDF uh, grant cycle. And uh, here we're we're still thinking about exactly what that uh, right. you know, request for proposals will look like, uh, but uh, we're always excited to be able to put out a call for people, for researchers to send us their, their best science so we can go about uh, trying to stimulate uh, mitochondrial disease research. Well, I, I know we'll be planning to fund our postdoctoral fellows through our accelerators program. I'm right. going to be excited to talk to some of those folks here, yeah. here in a little bit. Uh, but again, in our commitment to fund research across all stages of careers, um, a really exciting time for the community and the organization to put some of these donor dollars to work. Absolutely. That's, it's all about delivering mission. And, you know, these grant cycles represent a really important way for us to take our donor dollars and, and, and put them to work. Well, we talk often about, you know, our goal every day is more impact more often, right? We want to bring more and we want to do it more often as we can. And I think about some of the programs that are all converging at once as a major impact to our community, the, the first one that really catches my eye as we think about uh, the, the, the mitochondrial disease journey is this new genetic testing pilot program that we have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the starting point, right? So we've talked about our roadmap for, for a number of years of improving the diagnosis of mitochondrial disease, developing treatments and cures, and ensuring that our patients have uh, optimal clinical care. But it begins with getting a diagnosis, right. and it, it's well established that probably half or more of the mitochondrial disease patients don't yet have a confirmed genetic diagnosis. And there can be many reasons for that. But uh, the goal of this new program will be really to test a new model where the patients themselves are going to provide symptoms, um, the, what, how they're affected, uh, and then we're going to use... Uh, partner technology with a little bit of machine learning and AI associated with it to look for patterns in those symptoms that represent what a mitochondrial disease patient um, looks like. And then those candidates that are identified will be eligible to receive a, a no-cost um, genetic test. And uh, we'll use a testing laboratory. The result will come back to them, to their healthcare provider, and our goal, more than anything, is to try and drive as many diagnoses of mitochondrial disease as possible. 
we're calling it a pilot program because this is a new approach, right, to doing uh, genetic testing and to enabling diagnosis. Uh, but really is excited to get get it out there and and, and get started with it. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see can we improve the diagnosis of mitochondrial disease by actually using the patients themselves to share with us their symptoms, their journey on mitochondrial disease or their disease. Well, speaking of improving and shortening the journey as well, too, I think it plays nicely with our soon to launch MitoShare patient registry as well, too. You know, we think about this uh, pathway that our families are on, the pathway to diagnosis, finding ways to shorten that, yeah. the pathway to developing therapeutics. And it yeah. starts with a, um, a well-populated patient registry. It, it really does, right? So, so all of these programs we're going to discuss are really integrated to each other. But as you can imagine, as we drive diagnoses, we want to make sure we have the opportunity to remain engaged with, with those patients, present relevant research opportunities to them, continue to collect information to the extent they're comfortable sharing with us, all with the goal of advancing that treatment and cure silo of the overall right. roadmap. So the, the launch of the new patient registry is really exciting, particularly as we're trying to identify and characterize even more mitochondrial disease patients through the genetic testing program. Well, it's all centered around voice of the patient, right? The, the Our patients sharing their experiences, the burden of this disease, their hopes, the opportunities, and our organization is finding more ways to bring that voice to regulatory bodies, uh, to government officials, to our community at large. We want to make sure that we we plant that flag and that we're loud and proud about the good work we're doing. So, so much activity happening in that space in terms of drawing more attention about mito patients. Um, I'm excited personally about the launch of some new clinical trials, educational products that we have coming out. We have a new matchmaking tool that's probably going to hit here in late November, a new website, a new hub to have patient families connect with clinical trials and be educated on the clinical trials. This is a new era for mitochondrial disease. It, it really is. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves of that, right? Like we're all pushing hard. Nothing is more important than trying to address this huge unmet medical need of, of no therapeutics, no approved therapeutics for mitochondrial disease. So how do we do that? Well, it's some combination of research and education. Yeah. So uh, I'm really excited about what we're putting together uh, for the website and with some of the tools that we're going to provide to just make it easier for our patient community to learn about clinical research, how they can participate in it, and what opportunities may be available to them that they're good candidates for. We're always here to support and answer any questions, but you know, I think we're really up in our game, Brian, and I'm yeah. really excited about it in terms of just helping to educate the, the patient community and make it easier for them to access the information and understand the role they play. Because to be clear, we will not have treatments and cures for mitochondrial disease if the patient community is not engaged in the process. And let's be real here too. Engagement for us also includes the fact that there's price tags on these initiatives, Absolutely. right? And, and none of this work is done without the generous support of our donor community. We've been talking a lot this holiday season about um, the care team for our patients. And, you know, we're launching a new campaign that that highlights um, the the folks that make up a care team of mitochondrial disease patients. So that's everything from the doctors, the nurses, the genetic counselors, to the the folks at church or synagogue, the um, the teachers, the, the neighbor who brings lasagna when you're not feeling well, right? Mm -hmm. It's so important to understand what that care team is. I've been reflecting a lot about our care team as an organization who helps take care of UMDF. And right at the center of that, are the generous donors who have made our patients a priority. And it's what I'm really excited about today's conversation is we're, we're converging philanthropy and impact. And I think that's so important. It's very easy for an organization to go out there and, and ask for money for, for support. And it's the right thing to do to show the impact of that support. But what I really love to see is when we bring those two together, right? When the donor community gets to hear from those who are out there, boots on the ground, doing the work. When I think yeah. about our care team, boy, Phil, it's our, our guests today are, are certainly a big part of this. And our, <laughs> our, our first guest um, has been a member of this care team at UMDF for quite some time. Um, he's been a tireless advocate for mitochondrial disease patients. I'm also proud to say he is now a United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation trustee. And probably his most important title is he's a proud dad. 
And uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome into the powerhouse, Mr. Alan Breslow. Alan, welcome to the powerhouse. Hi, Alan. Thanks, Brian and Phil. I'm Do you really feel glad extra to be here. powerful that you're in the powerhouse. Today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we I mentioned it. That. We mentioned at the top of this episode. It was a very special episode, being our tenth episode. Uh, but why this is really special is what I was just sharing. We're going to be chatting with our donor friends and also the folks who are doing the good work from a mission side, and um, all centered around this really wonderful initiative called Cousins for a Cure. And Alan, I was hoping to kind of kick things off today. If you could just share with uh, folks who may be watching this today who aren't familiar with Cousins for a Cure, a little bit about what makes that effort so special. Well, um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to share with you. Um, Sydney, our daughter, uh, was born in uh, May of 1992. And uh, by the time she was six years old, we knew something wasn't quite right, but we really didn't know what it was. And so we sought numerous specialists and searched for an answer uh, for eight years. Mm -hmm. And um, in 2000, uh, when Sydney was uh, about nine years old, she was diagnosed with, a, an, with an unspecified mitochondrial disease and treated uh, with a very individualized uh, mito cocktail plus numerous other supplements uh, prescribed by her mito specialist, Dr. Richard Kelly. Uh, in 2009, Sydney required spinal fusion surgery to correct uh, uh, an increasing, increasingly uh, bad curvature of her spine. And uh, what's, what's important about that is about six weeks after her surgery, uh, she experienced a dramatic drop in her vitamin E levels uh, which caused almost stroke-like symptoms, uh, most notably a significant loss of balance and loss of speech articulation from which she really has never fully recovered. And it was, it was virtually overnight. In 2013, um, and I was listening to the conversation earlier about the, the, the search for answers and, and how long it's taken. Well, 2013, mm -hmm. genetic testing had kind of reached a level where uh, Sherry and I uh, both uh, uh, submitted to genetic testing and uh, we uh, came to, to learn that we had uh, both given her a uh, a uh, uh, variant of the what's called the MECR gene, uh, but at the time the genetic anomaly was was not really associated specifically, as we understand, with any specific mitochondrial disease. Uh, in 2017, uh, as science has improved and 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 learning has improved, uh, Sydney received a uh, definitive diagnosis for her mitochondrial disease uh, uh, called MEPAN. M-E-P-A-N. It's a newly uh, diagnosed uh, or described mitochondrial disease that's caused by the two mutations of the MECR uh, gene. And there's currently, as we understand it, only 19 uh, patients around the world that have this, uh, at least that we know of, that have this uh, specific uh, uh, variant. And MEPAM patients typically have optic nerve atrophy, which results in vision loss, uh, dystonia, uh, movement disorders, uh, difficulty walking and, and balance issues, uh, loss of uh, speech articulation, as well as uh, low muscle tone. But on a positive note, MEPAM patients uh, are not co they're cognitively normal. And so um, uh, for Sydney, uh, she actually earned her undergraduate and master's degrees in special education, lived independently in Raleigh, North Carolina prior to COVID, uh, and has worked for a, uh, a nonprofit in Raleigh, North Carolina for the last four years. Unfortunately, while even the simplest uh, daily uh, tasks in life are extremely difficult and exhausting for her, uh, she's a fighter and she's mm -hmm. learned to become a, a, a real fighter uh, with with she has unequaled tenacity. Uh, we we kind of are we're really amazed every day uh, as we see her fight through what she has to deal with. And so um, it's our hope. And I'll talk a little bit about Cousins for a Cure in a moment that through the research that Cousins for a Cure 
uh, continues to fund that we're going to be able to improve the treatment and potentially cure MEPEN and many other mitochondrial diseases. Um, Science and, and research as research as researchers have made incredible progress in, in a really very, very short time. It's only uh, a few years since uh, she was diagnosed uh, through the early years of a rather long journey to figure out what was going on. And so it really gives us a great hope, not only for Sydney and the 18 other MEPAN patients, but more uh, for the thousands of patients that are diagnosed with mitochondrial diseases each year. So the way Cousins for a Cure sort of came to be was um, uh, right after Thanksgiving um, eight years ago, uh, I guess we're coming up on the ninth, uh, ninth anniversary, um, the day after Thanksgiving, um, we were all gathered like we always did uh, with family in, in Raleigh, North Carolina with our, at our, uh, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law's house with their family and uh, uh, my uh, extended family as well. And um, on the Friday after, um, one of our nephews, Logan, uh, Logan Sloan Aronson, was uh, killed in a, a mm -hmm. traffic a car accident. And I remember Sherry and I uh, driving to Raleigh back, we were at my parents' house in Greensboro that night. And uh, uh, the first thing, that uh, Logan's parents said is that they wanted to make his his life sort of a a, a memorial and and something positive, and they wanted to help fund something that they could do to help Sydney, mm -hmm. and that's where Cousins for a Cure was born, and um, from from there it has uh, it has continued to uh, amaze us at. Uh, the generosity of uh, friends and family and business associates that have allowed us to to fund some very very exciting projects uh, that we're going to talk a little bit yes. about. Uh, I'm excited about that. I mean, um, yeah. The just the the incredible and lovely tribute to Logan is just something that continues to inspire us. If you think about taking something like that and turning it into something very special like this, uh, certainly something that our organization is grateful for and. What's funny, I, I was maybe making some tally marks for the number of times you said the word positive. And I think about just uh, some of the time I've had to spend with Sydney. It would be the first thing that kind of comes in my mind when I think about Sydney is just her positive approach. So I hope you might be able to just share a little bit of like, where does she get that from? Like talking about her, her courage and her resolve. Well, I'd like to take credit, but I will give, <laughs> I'll give the credit an opportunity for you to prop up Sherry as well, too. If you'd like. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I'll give the credit to my wife. Um, she is uh, uh, she is Sydney's guardian angel uh, supporter. Um, uh, she she knows how to 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 help Sydney uh, come to the conclusions that she can on her own and make decisions. And you know, over the years, as as Sydney has gotten uh, older, she'll be she reminds us uh, many times that she'll be thirty next year. Uh -huh. um, uh, she has a mind of her own. And uh, again, I mentioned the tenacity, uh, but uh, uh, she is very focused and driven uh, in, in life and in helping people and also uh, in helping people in what she does, uh, uh, working for a nonprofit now. But uh, um, she is also driven to, to, to help uh, support this cause and, uh, and, and, look uh, for, look, you know, do the things necessary to, to help us uh, uh, drive towards treatments and cures for this We're disease. Lucky to have that, that type of energy, that type of spirit behind this. And boy, speaking of that, Alan, the, this past year, we've been celebrating our 25th anniversary, as you know, and, and I'd ask all the staff to share their favorite moments of working at UMDF at their time here. And admittedly, I've only been with UMDF for just a little over three years. And I shared a moment that my number one 25th anniversary moment, my three years here, it has to do with your family. And I'll never forget this. Uh, this was the very first symposium that I had to be a part of uh, since coming on as CEO. And we were running our big pitch contest, which is the 
peace day resistance of our accelerators program, where we have a competitive grant that goes out to postdoctoral fellows. It's vetted by our grant review committee, and then we select finalists. And they come to our symposium and they pitch on stage. You get a five minute pitch. And we're doing these pitches. And um, it was all finished. It was part of our, our um, you know, morning event at symposium. And Alan comes up to me and says, I want in on this. I'm inspired by this. And it just uh, kind of set me back a little bit to say, we want to cover whoever the runners up are on this. And I wanted to ask you, Alan, like what moved you to do that, to say that? Well, Sherry and I were sitting at, uh, at uh, one of the tables and we're listening. And, and of course, as we prepare to vote, yeah. um, compare notes. And um, uh, we looked at each other and said, who do you vote for? They're all terrific, all three of them. And they're very different. And all, of, all three of them um, uh, give, give hope to different, different mitochondrial diseases how can you pick one and a, at the expense of the other two? And this is exactly, you know, why Cousins for a Cure is what it is. The goal here is, is certainly we have a selfish goal to find uh, better treatments and potentially a cure for our daughter. But there are so many uh, thousands of people that are affected by variants of, of mitochondrial diseases and, um, there's, there's so many opportunities to help so many people and we couldn't pick. So the easiest thing to do was say, you know, uh, let everybody pick the first and, and we'd like to fund number two and number three. Well, we're, we're really delighted today to, to have some of these accelerator prize winners join us today as, as part of this conversation um, with us today is Rachel Guerra. She's a postdoctoral research fellow at Washington University in St. Louis. And we have Dr. Zach Wilson, ACS postdoctoral fellow at the Hughes Lab from the University of Utah. So please join me in welcoming into our conversation today, Dr. Guerra and Dr. Wilson. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank well, you so I'll, much for having us. I have to say, Phil, my second favorite moment over the past three years so we, so Alan and Sherry came up to me and said, we want to underwrite the runners up. And the hardest part was keeping that secret until yes. the gala event where we were going to announce the winner. So again, yes. this competition that's so focused on, um, you know, funding postdoctoral fellows, there was only gonna be one winner until the Breslow's and the cousins for a cure event generously underwrote our runners up. So the look on Rachel and Zach's face when we're all on stage, we announced that our winner was Arwen Gao, proud recipient, the very first winner. Uh, but for me to throw that little surprise in there, we have great video of it, of your faces. We probably need a screenshot. I'd like if you make it like a profile pic on your LinkedIn. It would be fantastic for us. But I have to ask you guys, when you were on stage and you heard that news, Rachel, how were you feeling? I was just so blown away and, and so moved by by the generosity. I mean, the whole experience of being at the UMDS symposium and being able to interact with so many patients and families and advocates, it it really drives home why we do the work that we do. And so um, to have my research funded by such an amazing cause, um, I'm just so grateful. So I was I was shocked and and so happy too. Zach, I imagine you were skipping a little bit in your mind as well, too. Huh? <laughs> I, I, yeah, skipping maybe came later. The first <laughs> thing that Rachel said, right? You're shocked. You're just <laughs> blown away. Yeah. And just so I, to echo what Rachel said, you know, it, it was a really unique experience being at the symposium and being part of that. And just there's not many opportunities as researchers where we're with other researchers, clinicians, counselors families, patients, all unified in this pursuit. It was really, it was really amazing. Yeah. Then, well, as you know, Brian, that yeah. that's our evening of energy. And uh, I, I happened to 
be uh, in a good position at the banquet uh, at the table I was sitting at to kind of see Zach and his friends and colleagues right when the announcement was made and there were high fives and people running around there and a lot of yelling and you know I, I was just left with that moment of like wow this is yeah. energy right this is the positive energy that we're trying to bring to the community all about hope um, and it all begins uh, with that uh, generous, selfless act by the Breslow family to, to be supportive of, uh, of these uh, young investigators are so important to the future of mitochondrial disease. Yeah, you know, we make a commitment as an organization, Phil, to make sure we're, we're funding along the entire career journey. And I, I'm so delighted that we found a way to converge the donor community with the scientific community. And, and we had some fun with it. I mean, you, you all were a little bit of guinea pigs for us being the very first <laughs> class to go for this, but um, I know you had a great time with it. I, I, I know our donors, the, the folks who are tuning into this event, into this podcast, would love to hear some updates on what's been going on uh, with your work. And Rachel, I'll turn it to you first, maybe give us a, a, a new quick pitch on uh, what's been going on. <laughs> sure. So, so in my work, I've been studying this vital molecule in mitochondria called coenzyme Q10. Um, it's often very, very low in patients with mitochondrial disorders, or if you are unable to produce uh, CoQ10, this can also arise in mitochondrial disease. Um, but the interesting thing about this molecule is that we have very Im little information on how it's actually made. So um, my project has been to better understand how our cells uh, make this molecule um, in order to hopefully under uh, improve treatments in the future, because while many mitochondrial disease patients will take CoQ10 as a supplement, um, it's very inefficient because it can't get to the right place in our cells. So over the past few years, I've, um, I've learned a lot about mass spectrometry, proteomics, and lipidomics to try to understand how our cells use a dynamic complex of proteins to, to make this, this molecule. Um, so it's been a, a really great uh, learning experience. Um, learning, uh, building my technical repertoire. Um, and I've also had the, the chance to mentor um, new graduate students. Oh, too. wonderful. So, yeah, it's, it's been it's been great. I love scientific education, too. So being able to pass on uh, this passion for mitochondrial disease research to, to a new generation has been <laughs> It's great. working, Phil. Like, <laughs> this is our goal, right? We, we want more scientists invested in this, but more, more people thinking about yeah. the mitochondria. Exactly. Well, postdoctoral fellowship really is, you know, it's a training, it's a growth period, right? And, um, you know, I think Rachel's probably being a little modest and Zach can speak to this too, right? To, you know, Rachel also had to deal with her mentor changing institutions, right? And, and that teaches you something about being able to be flexible and adjust on the fly and, and deal with those changes. And then comes a pandemic, right, that we've all been living in as well. And that's had its, uh, uh, that brings its own challenges to conducting research as well. I'm, I'm sure both of you can uh, <laughs> nod in agreement on that front too. Certainly. <laughs> Zach, tell us about what's been keeping you busy the last couple of years. Yeah. So in our research, one thing that we do well is we use very powerful microscopes to visualize what mitochondria are doing. And what we do is we put the organelle under stress or we look to see what happens when mitochondria lose function and see how they dynamically respond to that. And by doing that, we've observed the formation of this unique structure. We call this the mitochondrial drive compartment. And my work's been really focused on, okay, what is this all composed of? What from mitochondria is going into this and what's being left out? And how is this protecting mitochondria and keeping them healthy when they're put under stress? Um, and what was really amazing is I was able to spearhead a collaboration with the University of Colorado Boulder. Mm -hmm. And they took our even our light microscopy a step further and did electron microscopy to really delve in deeper. And we've gotten some really amazing images of what this structure looks like. And uh, it turns out that stepping into a microscope room is a form of social distancing. So uh, <laughs> there you go. Right? You can still do that work. That's making lemonade, I guess. That's fantastic. <laughs> well, we're, we're so glad to have you two on our care team moving this good work forward. Uh, as, as Phil mentioned, a whole new set of challenges that, my goodness, we could have never planned for. And it's, it's just great to see, again, the, the positive outlook, 
the approach, the spirit you're bringing out. I, I love that you're taking the message to the, the generation behind you. Um, it's fantastic. That's what we're trying to create here. So thank you so much for all that you've been doing for us. Thank you. Thanks for being here, guys. Keep, keep, keep at it. <laughs> thank you so much for having us here. And, and we're so grateful for, for all of the support from, from all EMDF donors for, for powering this work. Right. Keep kicking down those doors. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Bye, guys. Well, Phil Allen, that, that leaves me um, certainly inspired. I also always create a list of things I need to go Google after I talk to really bright <laughs> researchers. I have to go to Phil and say, I okay. think by Google, you mean email me, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's out. <laughs> you know, it, it's very interesting. Um, they, they both spoke to the things that drew us to UMDF. Mm. As I recall, um, I can't even remember how many years ago, Sydney was very young. I think, uh, I think it was about 17 years ago, the first symposium we went to. And one of the things that, that we kind of saw was most of the doctors and researchers were um, later in their careers. And um, it's amazing to see young people coming into this field, scientists, researchers, and doctors, which by the way, was the other thing that uh, drew us to UMDF. Uh, it's very unusual going to a symposium where the, you have the medical side, the research side, um, that are meeting with uh, families and um, uh, uh, people that are are dealing with this horrible disease, the patients and the families and bring them together. And it's, 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 you don't feel like you're under the microscope. It's, yeah. it's really a discovery process. That's it's, it's very, very sad and depressing, but it's very uplifting at the same yeah. time. And to see the progress again, that has been made in the 25 years of UMBF. Again, it took us years and years to just get to a diagnosis and and things are moving at the speed of light now it's it's great it makes that care team very real when you go to that event and you see all the individuals who are invested in this cause and what a great um testament to that again seeing these postdoctoral fellows uh, really moving their their projects forward and it's great you know as we mentioned phil we we're focusing so much on um funding throughout all stages of development stages of careers and i think a, a place that the Breslow family, the Cousins for a Cure event, this fund came together, was starting to find approaches that were a little more targeted, a little more custom in nature, with an eye on you know, benefiting an individual mito patient, in this case, Sydney, but also finding projects that when you do that, have that halo effect and benefit the mito community as a whole. And I think our ne next guest in this project um, is really, again, a highlight of, of our ability to come together with family funds, the research community, and our organizational priorities to hopefully help make some of that magic happen. So delighted to welcome into the conversation, uh, Kirsten Keller, the genetic counselor, and Dr. Deb Murdoch, who is the principal investigator at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia on development of therapeutic models for MECR related diseases and funded by the Breslow Fund in 2019. So welcome to the conversation, Kirsten and Dr. Murdoch. We're so glad to have you in the powerhouse. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Kirsten, I'm, I'm going to say it. I'm jealous of your headphones. I mean, I thought I had the, <laughs> the cool ones here, but I let's know. talk about much more important issues than our headphones today. We'll talk about the good work that's being done at CHOP and with all the good work you guys are putting into this into this project. And Phil, you know, you were part of the, the early stages of pulling this all together. I think it'd be good for our viewers to kind of understand sure. the pathway of a custom project and how it got to where we are today. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I agree because, you know, that this really represents, uh, you know, the continued evolution of UMDF and our mission and how we deliver mission, particularly in the, in the research uh, silo. Um, you know, this is a case where, the family themselves, right? The Breslows, uh, but, but because they work so closely through Dr. Richard Kelly at, 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 at CHOP and, and at Penn you know, with those contacts to say, you know, we have a project here that's been discussed and, and could be of interest, right, for us to, to fund. But, you know, really important uh, to UMDF 
is the role of um, scientific peer review before we fund anything. Um, it, there are lots of good ideas out there, uh, but good research is predicated on other scientists looking at projects, critiquing the project, providing their feedback. Um, and, and so you know, the first step, right, was to take this kernel of a, of a research project and make sure that we circulated that within some of our scientific and medical advisory board to get their thoughts. And, and the feedback was very positive to say, you know, this looks like a really important research of a project. And, you know, I think for, for UMDF, you know, we, we take that as an important part of our responsibility in this process is that we're a partner to, to the Breslow family to be able to give them confidence that you're making good decisions with your donor mm -hmm. dollars. And we know how important that is, right, to the Breslows, to all of our donors. So this has really gave us the confidence to now move forward, uh, you know, in that discussion with Dr. Murdoch and, and others to say, okay, how can we make this happen? Here's the budget. What can you accomplish with it? Let's set some very specific goals of uh, what to achieve. And, you know, I think it, at this point, it's, it's probably helpful for uh, Dr. Murdoch just to kind of share the overarching goals, right, of the project. And, you know, I think with a particular emphasis on how it ties back uh, to, to the Breslow family in Sydney in, in particular. Yeah, so um, uh, as the UMDF has been a really um, great inspiration for me and a great tie to a family that, that, that has uh, mitochondrial disease in the family, um, Kirsten's also been a great tie between me and patients because I'm really a basic researcher. And so I've worked for a long time on the very basic what happens in a cell and how does how do mitochondria work. And so I'd been working on the pathway that MECAR works in for a long time, but until patients were discovered that have that mutation, um, we were kind of working in a little bit of a vacuum. I could tell you what happens in a tissue culture, in a dish, in a cell, but I couldn't tell you what was happening in an individual. And so learning what happens with those individuals, um, we can take it back in, to the lab and try to repeat those things and then see if we can treat them. And so most of our work in the past year, in the past two years, has been creating a mouse model of NEPAN disease. Um, so we made the same mutations that happen in individuals, and then we have the mouse, and with our long-term goal being to treat mice, um, to find different therapeutics, and to do trials on those mice, things that we couldn't do in people. Um, always going back to the basic science and what we understand about the pathway in cells. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this is really what I think was most exciting about the project is that yeah. uh, this is what's referred to as you know, translational research, right? So it's taking it from the, the basic research lab and beginning to translate it to, to the patients themselves. And so an exciting component of this is that we're actually able to involve Sydney in the process to collect a, a small skin sample and create some special cells. So maybe you could just you know, speak to the audience about why it's so important to, to get that patient sample so that you can tailor the research. Right. So when we talked to Dr. Kelly, um, who's Sydney's main physician, he told us that Sydney had had a small biopsy of her skin taken many years ago that was sitting at John Hopkins University. And so we sitting in a freezer, so they were in very good shape. So we contacted them and had to send us that vial. And so we can grow those cells in a dish. So all of those cells have Sydney's complete genetic makeup in them. But what we have are skin cells. So there's been a lot of technological advances lately that we can kind of take those cells back into more of an undifferentiated state so they can become anything. And so you can take those cells back to anything and then give them, you know, certain neurotransmitters or whatever you'd like so that you can make them a specific kind of cell. And so we've taken those cells and taken them back to that undifferentiated state, which is the first step and, and very exciting. Now we're working on making sure that we can turn those cells into other things. And why that's important is to understand what's happening in MEPON, we really need to look at what's happening in the brain. Right? Most of the phenotypes, most of the symptoms you see are coming from brain cells and nerve cells in the eye. And so we'd really like to have those cells in a dish with exactly Sydney's genetic makeup 
so that we can test things and, and on them and make sure that we can, you know, make the cells work better. So right now we're at the, at the stage where we're trying to differentiate those things into neurons. Right. And now you'll have a couple different models, right? You'll have these neurons that are carrying Sydney's specific genetic uh, pattern with them. And you also have a mouse model, right, uh, that you can screen potential therapies against. And Kirsten, maybe, uh, you know, this is a good opportunity for you to talk about your role in the project. It sounds like you nicely straddle the, the genetic counselor side, interacting with the patients, but also interacting in the lab with the, uh, with the mice involved in the research. Yeah, um, so my work in science really started in mouse research um, before I uh, got my license in genetic counseling. So I've been lucky enough to be able to kind of split my time between working with the families and the mice. Whereas Dr. Wallace says I genetic counsel mice a lot. Um, <laughs> but um, for me, I think it provides, you know, the nice bridge of being able to talk to the families and understand kind of the biggest symptoms that are maybe not reported in the literature, that we'll, what we can bring to the lab and also ask those questions um, that we would otherwise not have an idea that we needed to ask that question. Yeah, absolutely. Any Anytime we have the opportunity to humanize the research, right, and just sort of understand what's most important to the patient, this sort of patient-centered research is, I think, a big part of uh, how research in general is, is progressing and uh, ultimately will lead us to more impactful and meaningful treatments right, for, for the patients. So, you know, Dr. Murdoch, you've already talked about some of the accomplishments about being able to take the fibroblasts and and turn them into these uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, which can then be differentiated into different tissues, including neurons and this mouse model. I know there's some really exciting milestones ahead in the next year of your research that you're aiming for in terms of being able to now actually take compounds that look like they uh, impact the path, the key pathways inside these models and test them to see if maybe we can identify some candidates uh, to move forward in therapeutic development for Sydney and other MEPAM patients. True. So we're really trying to be very broad in how we think about therapeutics because there are some things that are very specific to mitochondrial fatty acid synthesis, you know, the, the pathway that, that MECAR works in. There's some things that are, you know, being used in mitochondrial patients right now that we're not completely sure if they're effective and we can test those things in the mice and have better ideas. And then there's some very new ideas coming out um, in therapeutics in general, like immunotherapy. And so we're learning as much as we can as we go, but at the same time, we don't wanna wait until we're completely sure about the pathway. We wanna try everything we can. And so we have three great candidates right now. There's one chemical that looks like it's different in the blood of the mice. Mm -hmm. And so we would like to see, and it's gone down. So we'd like to see if we can add that back and see if that's helpful. And it's a chemical that's really easily available to us. There are, um, you know, mitochondrial treatments like lipoic acid. We'd like to know if that's really working in patients um, and if we can improve that at all. And then there are other things like immunotherapy that are being, that have been very exciting in treating cancer and there's new treatments in Alzheimer's. And we're really hoping that we can try some of these things on the mice too. And we think it's going to be, we're going to learn a lot for MEPON patients, but we're also going to learn a lot about how to treat mitochondrial patients in general, and then how to treat the mitochondrial in the brain of all of us. So yeah. that's our goal. Yeah. I mean, and then it really demonstrates how a very focused project, right? That it's uh, um, really about trying to, to to do something for for Sydney uh, and you know and the Breslow family has the potential to have much greater impact out from them. Yeah. And of course, research costs money. Yeah. And you know, I know even with the, the generous funding from the Cousins for a Cure and the and, and the Breslow family, it only advanced the project so far. Uh, I'm sure you're already in the beginning stages of looking for uh, grant funding from the federal government, from uh, from the NIH, um, any progress to report on uh, bringing in additional dollars to support the project? So we have some proposals out right now. Where I think that's a, a constant part of our job is to constantly put out proposals and try to convince people that it's important and worthwhile to do. 
Um, so yeah, that's where we're putting out a lot of things right now and trying to get some funding back. Well, best of luck with that. And Alan, maybe this is a good chance to kind of toss it to you because that's part of what this discussion is about is the continual need to fundraise, to find ways to su support research. And I know how important this is uh, to, to your family. It is. And, um, you know, sometimes it seems like we're just at the beginning, but uh, then when uh, listening to Dr. Murdoch, we see how much progress was made in uh, a little bit over a year. Right. And um, uh, not just in the work that uh, uh, she and her team are doing and Kirsten and the team are doing it at CHOP, but also through other discoveries. Um, you mentioned immunotherapy and, and, and these other avenues and hopefully these different um, concepts can come together and, uh, and, and, address many diseases and, and um, uh, develop treatments and, and potentially cures. It's, it's, it's incredible. Um, and it does obviously take a lot of money. And that's our mission as the non-scientist here. Um, to uh, <laughs> yeah, but you're probably learning a lot more than I am. I learned a lot more today. <laughs> with Phil right there with you. But um you know, I, it's 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 interesting because uh, in in a number of the conversations as we were looking to to uh, fund various research uh, and projects that would focus on on MePan, remember a number of the conversations with Phil. Um, some of these things didn't didn't uh, pan out, and they were not approved. And um, uh, you know, as as a parent, uh, we're we're impatient, but by the same token. Uh, we, we do want uh, our donor dollars to go to the very best uh, and, and most, um, uh, I guess, well-proven as well as vetted projects possible. And um, uh, uh, through a, a few other projects that didn't make it, we, we wound up here and we couldn't be happier uh, because there is progress being made by, uh, by the team at CHOP. So it's, yeah. it's great. Yeah, really, really important point, right? That we we have to be willing to say no occasionally, right? Or the whole process really loses uh, credibility. And yeah. you know, Brian, I think th this is such a great model for us, right? As a, as a charity, to think about how we can work with other families that have the ability to do fundraising, have demonstrated it, that we can provide opportunities that extend beyond just what our, our, our normal research mission might do. Uh, yeah, I was about to say, I'm so glad we were able to say yes too, right? Yes. <laughs> and it, it, what a perfect illustration today of um, the connection between fundraising and, and impact. And uh, first and foremost, uh, Dr. Murdoch and Kirsten, we're, we're grateful uh, for the good work you put behind this. I know you weren't immune to this crazy past couple of years as well, too. And right. you know, doing research during this time um, presented its own challenges. And to, to hear you give this uh, feedback and these updates today is really important to our donors and to this organization to see that impact. So so thank you. We're, we're grateful for that. Thank well, you very much. Well, Phil, um, you know, you were mentioning this here. Um, you know, we've had conversations before with some um, friends of the organization who've talked about the battering ram approach, mm. right? Of you have these custom relationships, partnerships, research projects that can create a little crack, right? And then we can hit that battering ram hard to open up those floodgates there. And I think about that with this kind of project and you think about the complete picture of, of what we talked about today, right? We've got postdocs who are out there pushing their work in the kind of greater Mido right. community. We have this um, much more kind of bespoke project to, to benefit Sydney and to benefit the Mido community as a whole, as we've just talked about today. Um, it's all about shots on goal. We have to find many different ways to do this. And clearly what we heard today is that's what's happening. Yeah, pick pick your favorite metaphor. It's shots on goal, it's planting yes. seeds. You know, we at the end of the day, you know, with research, uh, it, it, it you know it is it is research, and there are no guarantees. But you know, we we have to uh, take some chances, right? We have to put the money to work in a way that you know we believe, you know, based on good science, that there's the best opportunity 
to learn about the disease and ultimately fulfill our mission of, of developing those uh, treatments and cures. Well, we're, we're lucky to have a couple members of that care team with us today. So Dr. Yeah. Murdoch, Kirsten, thank you again for all your good work and for joining us today. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, for joining thank us. you. Thanks for having us. It's good to see everybody. Well, Alan, I, I'd like to take it back just a little bit. You know, we talk about this process of UMDF serving as kind of a, a steward for this project, for your family and that proper scientific vetting. I want you to take me back a little bit. Uh, you know, we talked about kind of what excited you from the um, accelerator standpoint, but that moment where the, the excitement of the opportunity started to build for you and your family as it related to this special project. Well, I guess just really it started with the approval of the project, uh, first and foremost, right. and um, uh, meeting with uh, Dr. Murdoch and, and uh, uh, Dr. Wallace. Um, I guess he is his his title is the five father of mitochondrial uh, research or disease. I'm not sure. That's a good one to have on the project either yeah. way. Right? Yeah. He's, he's certainly in the pantheon of, of great mitochondrial researchers. And. And again, uh, uh, Dr. Richard Kelly, who's uh, uh, interacted with with them for so many years, far far many far more years than uh, before Sydney was born. But uh, um, the it, it's all about the team, and there are so many people. Uh, so many researchers, scientists, doctors, you know, it's, it's funny. We, we ask the question a lot of time of, of doctors that are more our peers. Are you, do you know what mitochondrial diseases are, or what mitochondria are? And so many doctors that are in their fifties and sixties and older had never even studied it. And now, um, uh, Sherry and I were just with a, uh, uh, uh a resident in a particular, uh, in an Uber, he was driving, uh, just this past weekend. And, um, uh, we asked him if he, if he, I don't know how we got on the subject, but, uh, if he had studied mitochondria and is like, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and went on to tell us about the, the studies and, and its connectivity, not only to mitochondrial uh, disease and disorders, but potentially to so many other diseases. Um, it's, it's really staggering. Uh, and so there is for us an excitement that what we're doing now, uh, can pave the way for, for treatments and cures, not only for MEPAN and other mitochondrial diseases and disorders, but potentially many other related diseases that uh, that are, if you will, big name diseases uh, that everybody knows what they are. But uh, it sounds like mitochondria uh, may be at the root of many of them. Uh, this this is no longer a you know a question of scientific doubt, right? The the central role of mitochondrial health in the human health condition, right? And, and that's really, you, you hit the nail on the head, Alan, right? What's so exciting about what we're doing here in partnership with families like yours and, and many others is you know, anything we can do to improve mitochondrial function for these rare inherited disorders really does have the opportunity to move out to much more common diseases, metabolic diseases like diabetes, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and ALS, you know, all, all the way out to aging, healthy aging, where literally every person on the, the face of the earth you know, should care about the, the health of their mitochondria. And we're just at this inflection point of really understanding this and being able to think about therapies right to improve mitochondrial function so it's a very exciting time for our patient community for all of us and uh, we're, we're thrilled that uh, you're, you're such a, a great partner for us in this process well i need to thank you both first and foremost i can't think of a nicer way to put a bow on such a wonderful conversation thank you alan for sharing your family story uh, for being an unwavering supporter of umdf and i know you'd be the first one to say it's not alan it's Alan, it's Sherry, it's Sydney. What it really is, it's your care team. Your care team are the experts who are with us today. Your care team are the folks who are tuning in, watching this, the ones who've made that same commitment to our organization. So on behalf of UMDF, we're grateful to your family and your legion of supporters. And Phil, again, reminding us that um, there's good work being done. There's a lot of work to do. 
Yeah. And, and that's what drives us every single day. Phil and I both would just be bored out of our minds <laughs> if we didn't have big things to solve. Yep. And I leave today's conversation inspired that we've got the right care team together to help answer these big questions. And we're going to find more. You know, it's, it's great to hear. You know, I, I wrote down here, we clearly were making moves when we're hearing the uh, resident Uber driver <laughs> bringing this up, right? I mean, we kind of chuckle about it, but you know this, Alan, Phil, more often than yeah. not, it's might have what? Yeah. Those are big wins for us. Mm -hmm. when, when Rachel shares earlier that she had an opportunity to talk to the folks coming up mm -hmm. about mitochondria disease, this is, we're still eating this elephant a bite at a time a little bit. Right. But I'm, I'm really excited that we're seeing some progress and that we're putting philanthropic dollars to work to showcase impact. That's our goal. Well, our goal always to Phil Allen, as you know, is to go fast when we can. And it's how we wrap up this conversation on the Powerhouse podcast every single time is that we want our eyes on that. We wake up every day finding more ways to kick down a few more doors. And clearly we have some friends out there who are helping us do that. So until next time, everyone. Go fast.